Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we give thanks unto thee for the heritage which is ours in Jesus Christ. We thank thee that in thy providence thou hast brought into being these United States. And we pray, our Father, that even as thou didst raise up this people unto thee, thou wilt now purge them of iniquity and make them afresh a people dedicated to faith in thee, yielded to thy sovereignty, serving thee in faithfulness and in joy. Bless us now, our Father, as we study thy word. Grant that we may behold wondrous things out of thy law. In Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture today is the sixth chapter of the book of Daniel, Sovereignty and Justice. Daniel 6, Sovereignty and Justice. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom an hundred and twenty princes, which should be over the whole kingdom. And over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was first, that the princes might give accounts unto them, and the king should have no damage. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could find none occasion for fault, nor fault, for as much as he was faithful. Neither was there any error or fault found in him. Then said these men, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king and said thus unto him, King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes, the counselors and the captains, have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for thirty days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing, that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which offereth not. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. Then they came there and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signed a decree? that every man that shall ask a petition of any god or man within thirty days, save of thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. The king answered and said, The thing is true, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which offer not. Then answered they and said before the king, That Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee, O king, nor the decree that thou hast signed, but maketh his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was so displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. Then these men assembled unto the king and said unto the king, Know, O king, that the law of the Medes and Persians is, that no decree nor statute which the king establisheth may be changed. Then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords. 
that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and passed the night fasting. Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste unto the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel, and the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God, whom thou servest continually, able to deliver thee from the lions? Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. My God hath sent his angel and hath shut the lion's mouth, that they have not hurt me, for as much as before him innocence he was found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. Then was the king exceeding glad for him, and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no manner of hurt was found upon him, because he believed in his God. And the king commanded, and they brought those men which had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, and their wives. And the lions had the mastery of them, and break all their bones in pieces, or ever they came at the bottom of the den. Then King Darius wrote unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell on, in all the earth, Peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed and his dominion shall be even unto the end. He delivereth and rescueth and he worketh signs and wonders in heaven and in earth, who hath delivered Daniel from the power of the lion. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. When Darius the Mede was set over the Babylonian kingdom by Cyrus, he very quickly promoted to particular eminence Daniel. In Daniel, he found one who was a thoroughly trustworthy and dependable as well as capable administrator. And so Daniel not only became head of the presidents and over the princes, but very quickly he was going to be promoted to a position next to Darius himself. And he incurred at this point the animosity, the jealousy, the hatred of the other administrators. Joseph Parker a century ago in commenting on this passage wrote and I think his words are worth quoting yet here we come upon words we gladly would have omitted from the history then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom they tested his policy at every point. They pressed all their weight down upon the policy and purpose of Daniel in things imperial. But that policy bare all the burden. They could find none occasion nor fault for as much as he was faithful. Neither was there any error or fault found in him. Then, what should they have said? They ought to have said thus, any religion that will make a man so faithful, so trusty, so real, and so beneficent is a good religion, though we cannot explain it and though we never heard of it before." Unquote. 
But of course, this is not what they said. And men hate nothing more than innocence, because in their sin they want to reduce all things to their level, and they breathe out hatred and contempt for those who are not involved in their crime, in their corruption, in their depravity. And so they took counsel together and persuaded Darius to establish a royal statute that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for thirty days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. This was so routine a matter that it required no persuasion to convince Darius of this. It was already basically a part of their faith. Because the kingdoms of antiquity believed that the monarch represented as well as the reigning empire, the high point of the evolving forces of nature, of the God in nature, so that there was an incarnation, a manifestation of that divinity in the ruling power. Therefore, any prayer to any God or force or power in nature had to be through that person because he was the mediator. This, of course, was the whole point of the persecution of the early church in the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was the dominant force in history. Therefore, the true mediator between God and man, the true incarnation of the forces of history, was the Roman Emperor. And any and every religion was good which recognized that. It was then a true religion. And therefore, Christianity at any time could have had a legal status as a legally recognized religion in the Roman Empire if one required its leaders offered incense, a symbol of prayer, before the image of the emperor. It would indicate that then they prayed through him, in his name. We as Christians pray in Jesus' name. This is the only way we can pray. The only Christian prayer that is not in Jesus' name is the Lord's Prayer, which is in his words. And so in that case we need not invoke his name since we pray in more than in his name, in his words. But this was a stipulation. Christ under Caesar. Caesar as the true incarnation. Caesar as the true mediator. Hence, when the king or emperor reigned, he was regarded as the door between God and man, the door between man and paradise, the door between man and the fulfillment of his hopes and his prayers. So that when Jesus Christ declared, I am the door, by me, if any man go out, uh, come in, he shall go in and out and find pasture. I am the way to fulfillment. I am the way to God. I am God incarnate. I am the door. With this, Jesus Christ guaranteed that all who followed him would face conflict from the powers of the state that there would be persecution from Rome, that there would be persecution at the hands of every force that set itself up 
as the evolving incarnation of the divinity in nature. It guaranteed that there would be conflict between Marxism and Christianity. It guaranteed that there would be conflict between all true believers, all orthodox believers, and the United States as it is today. Because as not the Supreme Court said over and over again in one form or another, from the days of Holmes to the present, that there are no truths, no absolutes. Chief Justice, Justice Vinson stated it openly. There are no absolutes. There is no law beyond the court. So that the state is God walking on the earth. It is the final, the absolute, the ultimate power. And it is no wonder that a state dedicated to such a faith must sooner or later begin persecuting true believers. And the churches dedicated to such a faith must begin persecuting true believers. This morning I read a church periodical of the convention of that church recently, and this is the kind of thing you find in one church periodical after another today. There was a move towards the ordination of women. And those who opposed it were told by a very prominent authority within the church that they were guilty of ethnic, racial, and sexual discrimination, which was anti-Christian. And another man said that any who believed in the infallibility of Scripture were demonic. The persecution is inevitable for a state and a church hold to such a belief. Jesus said, I am the door. By that declaration, he ensured warfare unto death. And because he is sovereign, it will mean finally the death of the godless state. Council of Chalcedon, by emphatically declaring that Jesus Christ is the unique incarnation of God, the only door, declared once and for all that for any true Christian there can be no compromise. This, then, was a logical belief for the Medo-Persian Empire. It represented everything they held to. And Darius signed the writing and the decree. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as he did a fourth time. Daniel prayed towards Jerusalem, now in ruins. But he prayed towards Jerusalem because there was the temple and there the altar typifying the Messiah, the sin-bearer who was to come. So in his way before Christ, he was praying in Jesus' name. But quite obviously, they had someone, a servant in his household, in their pay. And his enemies assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before God. And so they demanded his death from Darius. 
that he be cast into the den of life. The lion's den, death at the hands of animals, is an old punishment in human history. We're very familiar with it, not only from the story of Daniel, but from the story of the martyrs in the arena at Rome. It's still a very common form of execution in many, many parts of the world. But because nowadays we are so bent on promulgating the natural goodness of man and world brotherhood, we don't bring up these nasty facts lest someone think that the peoples of Africa and Asia and elsewhere might be barbaric. And that would be an unforgivable sin to believe that. But its purpose was to degrade the man. It was reserved for particularly contemptible crimes, for crimes that were considered by the ruling powers to be especially bad. For a man to kill a man is at least to treat him with some dignity. But to have him executed by animals is to express the ultimate in contempt. This was the sentence for Daniel. Darius, of course, didn't like it. Darius, regarding Daniel as his right-hand man, wanted to spare Daniel, but they reminded him that no decree nor statute which the king establisheth may be changed. The Medo-Persian law had certain basic premises. First, the king was a priest and mediator, the link between heaven and earth. Second, the good life was possible only in terms of his order and in his name. Third, the fundamental laws of being were expressed through his ex cathedra utterances. And fourth, this priest king was the focal point of heaven and earth, and every utterance he expressed so infallible that he himself could not set it aside. This was the reason why Cyrus, one of the greatest of Persian monarchs, was so given to sobriety. Many a Persian monarch, either through anger or misunderstanding or drunkenness, signed orders that he lived to regret. One monarch condemned his closest and best friend to death. And when he realized what had been done, he tried everything possible to overrule himself, but he could not. For so to have done would have been to destroy his own kingship. This, then, was the tragedy of Darius. His law said death to Daniel. To break it was to cease to be king. His love for Daniel said life to Daniel, but he could not give it without ceasing to be king. God in Christ satisfied both law and love in the cross, which expresses the absolute justice and law of God in its condemnation of sin, and also the grace of God, the love of God, who while we were yet sinners gave his only begotten Son to die for us. This perfect law, this perfect love, this perfect and infallible 
wisdom can only exist in God and in heaven. And whenever it is transferred to the earth as it was in antiquity and as it is today on all sides of us, it ensures one thing, the reign of injustice and the condemnation of the just. Darius found no way out, and so pitifully he turned to Daniel and said, hopefully, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. The king then went to his palace and spent a sleepless night. He did not permit instruments of music to be brought before him to try to lull him to sleep. He was unhappy, he was upset, deeply disturbed. His sleep went from him. Very early the king arose and went in haste unto the den of life. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel, and the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God, whom thou servest continually, able to deliver thee from the lions? And out of the den came the voice of Daniel, My God hath sent his angel, and hath shut the lions' mouth, but they have not hurt me. The king commanded, and they brought those men which had accused Daniel. They and their households were all cast into the lion's den. And before they had even fully hit the bottom of the den, the lions had killed them. And Darius declared in a decree, respect as a legal requirement for the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. He delivereth and rescueth, and he worketh signs and wonders in heaven and in earth, with delivered Daniel from the power of the body. We today face a world not unlike that which Daniel faced, not as far gone, but in some respects further gone in that the whole world today is moving to establish this kind of kingdom, a world state which will say, I am the door. And we are told already that 1976 is the date when this world order will be openly and fully proclaimed, and by that time the world church is to exist. But our story, like that of Daniel, is written and is to be written in terms of the same God. Our God, whom we serve continually, he will deliver us. He is able, for he is the living God, steadfast forever, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. this confidence, we can with Daniel stand against the iniquities of our age, knowing indeed we pay a price, but knowing also that our God is able. Let us pray. Our Lord and our God, we thank thee that thou art the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Moses, of David, and of Daniel, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank Thee, our Father, that we can face the future with Thee. Teach us, therefore, our Father, to walk in confidence and holy boldness, in faith and in prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we have our first question, I'd like to deal a little bit with one of the great attempts in history to establish such an order that by Frederick II of the Holy Roman Empire, 1194 to 1250 are the dates of Frederick II. And Frederick II, on his coins, Kantorowicz tells us in his book on the subject, had not the smallest Christian sign, not the tiniest of crosses on scepter, orb, or crown. In other words, he reigned independent of the Christian God and the Christian faith as the new God on earth. Then, Cantorowitz writes further, an old Germanic proverb had it that God in, is the beginning of all law. And St. Augustine taught that God is the fount of justice. If the theorists of the days that followed the last Hohenstaufen had substituted the emperor in these two sayings, they would exactly describe the actual teaching of Frederick's Liber Augustalis. Now, among the phrases from his constitutions or laws, Frederick had this, the emperor must therefore be at once father and son, lord and servant of justicia, of justice. The emperor had comprehended and represented the living God as right and law as justicia. Moreover, Kantorowicz writes, he established his infallibility, for he goes on to say, Therefore we scorn to err. In accordance with his in imperial infallibility, Frederick adopted, as the Norman kings before him had done, the sentence of Roman law, quote, to discuss the emperor's judgments Decrees and statutes is sacrilege, unquote, a sentence that was so vital to the constitution of the whole state that Frederick boldly quoted it to the Pope when he ventured to criticize some measure of the emperors. The emperor was the pinnacle of the world's structure. The emperor was the emanation of God as son of God. He was law incarnate upon the earth. It goes on page after page to describe him as God forcibly brought down into the state not merely the state exalted to a world-shunning universal deity. The emperor was the sole source of justice. And one of the laws was, it is sacrilege to debate whether that man is worthy whom the emperor has chosen at and appointed. So that it was impossible to criticize any government official as unjust 
because how could the emperor make a mistake? Now, a very prominent thinker who shared in the same kind of thinking as Frederick II, but has somehow been smuggled into the Christian fold as though he were a Christian, was Dante. Because in his Divine Comedy, Dante symbolized the Roman Empire as the tree of knowledge in the earthly paradise. But in spite of this, he still held that paradise was to be communism. And his whole thesis was that the empire represented the true form of Christianity. Frederick also held to a primeval chaos so that his relationship was with the cults of chaos. He believed that the fullness of time had now come under the scepter of the emperor, the emperor of justice, the expected messianic ruler whom the Sibyls had foretold. His thinking was very much as that of the abbot Joachim of Flora, one of the most prominent and dangerous heretics in the entire history of the church. And in terms of this same conception, Frederick placed himself on a par with Adam and with Christ as the bringer of the third and last age. Frederick placed himself on a par with Adam and with Christ as the bringer of the third and last age. This kind of thinking, of course, is not new. We're getting it in varying forms today in our legal theory. Are there any questions now? Yes. A very good question. Where, when there is evil in the civil order, does it have to run its full course? The answer to that is no, if the civil order is not too far gone. If the civil order is reasonably Christian and godly, it can subdue evil. Or if it is not Christian, if it is not too far gone, it can be reclaimed. But if it has passed a certain point, then it can only go on until it runs its course. Because one of the most important statements in Scripture at the conclusion of the sixth chapter of Isaiah is the most quoted passage from the Old in the New Testament. And it makes emphatic that after a certain point, God hardens the hearts, blinds the eyes, stops up the ears of the wicked, that hearing they may not hear and seeing they may not see, lest they turn and be converted. In other words, they're going to reap the harvest they're sowing. So this is a principle of Scripture. But after a certain point, God allows it to go ahead. It's going to run its course. Yes. Yes, but there are still differences. There are blessings of Christian society for all who are in it, but in varying degrees. The criminal is still punished. And the more 
industrious and hardworking and just the godly man is, the more he flourishes. So while it is a society that has blessing on it, there are different degrees of participation in that blessing. There is still a curse against sin in that society so that the evildoers are punished more quickly and readily. Now, in an ungodly society, the judgment of God is upon the whole of the society so that everyone in it is going to share to some degree in the collapse, in the judgment, in the shaking, in the devastation that follows. But again, there is a difference within that judgment, so that God's full judgment is brought to bear upon the evildoers and upon the evil structure of that society. And he delivers his saints in order that he might use them to rebuild a new society. And in the parable of judgment and the symbolism of judgment that uh, God gave to Ezekiel, he compared him to his hair which was shaven and then a third of it thrown into the fire and burned, a third of it tossed into the winds to be scattered totally, a third preserved. What this symbolized was judgment is coming upon Judah. Therefore, everyone is going to be uprooted, good and bad alike. But one third is going to be destroyed immediately. One third, they're being given to the wind. They're not going to get the same total destruction immediately, but they're finished as far as God is concerned. They're sown to the wind. They lose all significance and meaning. But another third are kept carefully because God has a purpose in terms of the future in and through them. This is the remnant. So God made clear that there was a difference in his judgment. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't hear that. Yes, Psalm 1 speaks of the trees planted by the rivers of water. And uh, the river is a familiar symbol in Scripture, and we meet with it again in Revelation, the river of life. And this, of course, is what every time we meet with the figure of the tree and the tree bearing fruit, the scriptures have in mind. Jesus Christ is the river of life, even as he is the tree of life. And we, as in terms of the symbol of the river, when we are planted along the river and draw nourishment from him, we bear fruit unto him. And the fruit is a godly life in terms of our calling. So that for a man, it is, first of all, obedience to God, the fulfillment of his calling under God, manifesting responsibility in terms of his calling to be a man. And uh, I'll return to that in a moment. For a woman, it is in terms of her womanhood, as a mother, a wife, each in their respective calling to fulfill their responsibility. This is what it means to bear fruit. In other words, to bear fruit has primary reference to our Christian vocation, that which we are called to be. It is not 
say in relationship to the church and a show of piety, but it is in terms of fulfilling our responsibility as God has laid it upon us in our particular place. So that those who are called to manifest it in terms of a church calling, that's another thing. But for each and every one of us, it is in terms of our calling as man and woman, as workman, as wife, wherever we are. Now, I said I would return to the question of the man's place uh, for a moment. I've gone into this before, but I think it's so important uh, it's worth restating. The Bible regards the sins of men as more serious than the sins of women. In a writing that is not yet completed or and therefore not published, I go into the death penalties according to the biblical law for men and women, and I think it's something like uh, oh, 18 to 3. There are more de death penalties for men than there are for women. For the simple reason that in the sight of God, the sins of a man are more fearful sins than those of a woman because he is more important. But you see what we've done in our day and age. We've reversed the whole thing. And uh, we've said, well, the woman, uh, it's up to her to be uh, moral and chaste, and it's up to her to take care of the religion and the family. It's up to her to be the protector of morality and so on and so forth. And this is putting a burden on the woman that belongs properly to the men. And we have God telling the people in the Old Testament, for example, and this is restated in other ways in the New Testament, that he will not punish the adultery of their wives and daughters when the fathers and sons are guilty of the same thing. Because theirs is the more fear fearful. Ultimately, he will bring judgment upon all of them. But he says, why do you expect me to punish the lesser evil, even though it is a fearful sin in my sight, when you wink at your own? The Bible, first of all, makes it clear that women are not to be ordained. And Paul is emphatic at that point. So that this is a deliberate setting aside of the word of God. Moreover, it is a subverting of the biblical principle of authority. So when the Bible speaks so plainly, we don't need to search any further. It has said this is morally wrong. And, of course, it is humanism because it is saying that man can rearrange the world in terms of his own thinking and imagination. And when man says we will uh, declare all people to be equal and uh, male and female equal in authority and so on and so forth, then they are ipso facto equal. Now, the Bible never says that women are less intelligent than men. As a matter of fact, nowadays they tend to be more intelligent and more studious too, more learned and more intelligent. What the Bible says is that dominion, authority, is given to the man. And the man tends to think objectively and the woman subjectively. Her thinking is intensely personal. This is extremely important. That's why a man needs a help me. Because his thinking is too objective. But the woman gets down to the very concrete, personal thing. Well, you need both. But each has its place. Yes.
tree of life is symbolical of Christ. He is the tree of life. And many of the early liturgies of the church uh, celebrated him as the tree of life. However, the tree of life is a common symbol in pagan antiquity of the world state. The world state is man's savior. And we find, of course, Nebuchadnezzar seeing himself as such, and almost every empire seeing itself as such, and the tree a very common symbol of many a state in antiquity, the state as the tree of life. But in the scripture, it is Christ who is the tree of life. Yes. No, I haven't, but Norman L. Jones is a very able, very brilliant young man. first of all, put it in a logical order. Second, he has put it in an order of importance. There are many churches, uh, they are usually called fundamentalistic, which believe that the most important thing is that a person know Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. Now, this is good. We cannot quarrel with that, but we must quarrel with the place they give to it for this reason. We do not learn the alphabet in order to know the alphabet. In other words, the alphabet is not the goal of education. It is simply the first tool. And as the Puritans said, we learn to read that we might know the word of God and might serve and glorify God. Now, salvation is not the be-all and end-all of everything. It is merely the starting point, the necessary, the essential, the inescapable starting point. But there are churches which stop there. Now, this is deadly. Paul said of those Christians who went no further than the ABCs that they were babes in Christ, and another word he used for them was one which we have in English, idiotes. In other words, an idiot. An idiot is a baby that's never matured. And this is the trouble with too many of these churches. They insist that the children must remain idiots. But being born again is the sum of Christianity. Well, it is the starting point. But the point of primary importance is the sovereignty of God and that we glorify him and enjoy him forever, that we serve him, that we magnify him, that we know him that we establish his word and his law in every sphere of human life. Now, what happens when you have churches that say in the spiritual realm 
we're going to stay with the ABCs. And we're a better church than all the others because we concentrate on the ABCs. And of course, they draw many people because they promulgate the idea that they're the real Christians. Somehow they're superior because they stay with the ABCs. Well, they promote a kind of spiritual idiocy. And while their churches are full of many good people, fine people, who have all kinds of promise of real growth, if they but turn to a thoroughly biblical kind of faith and ministry. The thing that characterizes these churches is that nowhere else do you have perhaps a higher percentage of con men operating in the clergy. Because when you keep people in the ABCs, you're going to make them easily fooled. And so people are running around constantly in every community across the country so that I get fed up to hear and community after community. Why? Because this and that church that people have painfully and expensively built up, they turn out to find it's a con operation. Of course it is. Because it is characterized by a faith that promotes spiritual idiocy. People must be born again. At that point, we can agree with these people. But they must be born again that they might grow into spiritual maturity. And the tragedy of our day is this, that most of what it calls itself the church is apostate. It is preaching humanism. It is anti-Christian to the core. And the rest of the church is proud to be idiotic. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well. Yes. Yes. Yes, if you keep it simple, you're not going to have problems. Uh, cradle babies are the easiest babies to handle. When they begin to grow, they're a problem to keep up with, and when they begin to think, that's when... Uh, yes, you have problems. You have to work harder. Now, I would say, however, that uh, even more basically, you would have to assert that while theologically the triune God is prior, logically you would have to say Scripture has to be given priority. The Westminster Confession, the first chapter, is on the scriptures. Why? Not because they place the Bible above the Trinity, which is then dealt with in a number of chapters, but because to know truly God, you have to declare what you believe concerning scripture. So you accept scripture as the infallible word of God the only rule and guide of faith and practice. Then having established that, you can know who the true God is. So that while God, of course, is first, pedagogically, you place the Bible first as the means to knowing the true God. Yes. That's the point to begin with. 
And this is essentially what uh, uh, Calvin's Catechism and the Westminster uh, Catechism teach. The first question, what is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever, which says the same thing in somewhat different wording. And this is what any and every true church must teach, that the chief end of man is, first of all, to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. In other words, it's not our happiness that comes first. It's not our salvation that comes first. It's the glory of God. And when we are saved, we put the glory of God first. I spoke a while back in uh, Arizona, and it was interesting. There was this one minister there. I wasn't talking on theology. I was talking on uh, the philosophy of law. He couldn't wait to ask a question. And he said, I'm certain from everything you've said that you believe in the sovereignty of God, as though this were the most horrible thing I could believe in. And uh, he became so outrageously insulting that uh, the chairman had to stop the discussion. But the sovereignty of man was everything to him. And yet he considered himself a Christian. In fact, he considered himself to be a very conservative Christian. But his conservatism was total humanism. Yes. I'm always willing to be in the case of I I never paid any attention before, but is it a rule that um to become a minister uh or have to add advertising in a certain church for people to become ministers young ministers? Never heard of such a thing. And uh I thought well this I haven't seen anything like that. I do know that today virtually every church is facing a crisis in that they have fewer and fewer recruits for the clergy. Well, yes. Well, of course, it's so taken over by subversives now that most of your churches, uh, frankly, today it's something to be ashamed of, that you're connected with the clergy. 